Madam uh, Minister, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, because I welcome also friends here in this audience. I will speak about the future of Europe, uh, but of course Brexit is also part of our future. So I will focus in my first part on, on Brexit and then later on, uh, on I will develop some ideas on the future of the EU 27. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not surprising when I say that Brexit is full of surprises. The result was a surprise, even for the leavers, and for me and many others, it was a sad surprise. No longer was the Union an irreversible project. It was established to create irreversible economic and political bonds for the sake of an everlasting peace. And the Union embodied values, and the most important of all, peace. The Union was and is much more than an economic added value. The Union is not an aim in itself. It is a peace project. And Brexit has national sovereignty as a goal in itself. If the Union falls apart, peace is not guaranteed in none of the countries of the European Union. It's a sad thing that the Brexit debate is mainly about trade and the future of the London city. Much more is at stake. And it was a happy surprise, again surprise, that the support for the EU membership among the citizens of the 27 increased dramatically after Brexit. I heard at noon that the approval rate for the European Union in Ireland is uh, 84%, almost a Stalinistic score. <laughs> for a large majority of them, Brexit was not a template. It would add, for most of our citizens of the EU27, it would add instability to an already instable world. The European Union had become part of our DNA, even if we lack enthusiasm. And for young people, a return to the old world of borders and national currencies seemed unworldly. And many Brits thought that the Brexit was the beginning of the end of the Union, the start of the unraveling process. This was not the case at all. It was the first in a long series of miscalculations. Another surprise was the unity of the 27 during the separation talks. Actually, we surprised ourselves. Britain is negotiating with a bloc, an entity that speaks with one voice. Remember the famous word of Kissinger? Yes, this time, you can call Brussels. There's somebody who's taking the phone and can speak on behalf of the 27. Britain speaks with many voices, and the United Kingdom is not so united anymore. It is obvious that in the talks on the future relationship, the Union has to work hard to keep that united position. But we are used to compromise. The Union is based on compromise. Look at the United States today, which is falling apart in two aggressively opposed groups where compromises are not possible anymore. Our British friends were surprised about this, of, of their negotiating position, actually a weak position. The main reason is that the UK is economically much more dependent on the EU27 and vice versa. 45% of UK exports go to the EU27, while only 8% 8, 8 of the EU exports go to the UK. The European Union also remains the biggest single market in the world, even after Brexit. The euro is the second currency in the world. And our economies, the economies of the Eurozone, are doing well and are creating 8 million jobs since 2014. The 27 
are negotiating with self-confidence and in a spirit of unity. And therefore, it is not a surprise that Britain have accepted the EU's proposals on the status of their citizens in the UK and on the divorce bill. By the way, the EU proposals weren't extravagant at all. From day one after the referendum, it was clear that an arrangement was needed to cover the period between Brexit, 29th of March 2019, and an agreement on the future relationship, mainly a free trade uh, agreement, or that is one of the assumptions. Now, it is clear that there is no alternative than to stay in the single market and in the customs union during the transition. Negotiating a, bes a bespoke transitional arrangement could be as difficult as discussing, for instance, a free trade agreement. Two years will even be short to negotiate a free trade agreement, but we we'll always can prolong a period of transition. All this was known in advance. It took time to acknowledge reality. The British position is also affected by the breakdown of the special relationship with the United States. The policy differences with the, Americans, with the American presidents were and are huge. And the most striking example is trade. The UK want to be, become the champion of free trade at the moment that the Americans are protectionists. And at the same time, the European Union finalized a trade deal with Japan, the biggest ever trade deal in the history of the European Union. And other free trade agreements are in the pipeline. Never forget, nevertheless, that free trade agreements are mainly about goods. But the British industry is relatively half as important as those of many European countries. It remains a paradox that Britain is eager to conclude trade deals with non-European countries whilst it is leaving free access to its biggest market. But it's not the only paradox. What is also surprising is that exports to the EU27 require compl compliance with the European norms and standards, also in the framework of a free trade agreement. You have to comply with our norms and our standards. But the rhetoric is about get, regaining control and establishing their own standards. Regarding our future definitive relationship, there are two options for Britain, either staying in the single market and the customs union or agreeing on a free trade agreement. The first option is economically less destabilizing but makes Britain dependent on external decisions. The second one is in any case worse than the first one, especially, but not only, especially for the city of London, which is losing its passporting rights to work and to operate on the European continent. The first choice is different, difficult for the, for the leavers, and I doubt if there is a majority for option two, uh, a and, and free trade agreement, if there is a majority in Westminster precisely because the British people would be worse off. For Ireland and the Euro European Union, there is, on top of this, a difficulty with option two. Avoiding a hard border is a major hurdle to take. My assessment is there is actually only very limited leeway for compromise. Let us wait and see. Is Brexit reversible? Ladies and gentlemen, nothing in life is irreversible. Nothing in life. One can regret the first decision at any time and change one's, one, one's mind. The most rational decision is to opt for more prosperity and more power. When you lose both, there will be a backlash sooner or later. When my country gave up its national currency, the Belgian franc, we won on both issues on power and on prosperity. We lost monetary sovereignty, but it meant just nothing because 
we were already loyal followers of the Dutch mark. When something happened in Frankfurt, we followed within 10 seconds. We gained in terms of influence while we gave up monetary sovereignty because we became a seat in the board of directors of the European Central Bank. What we perceive as reality is not necessarily real. Ladies and gentlemen, my second part, as I said, is about the future of the EU 27. The challenge now, and I come back on this issue later on, the challenge now is to decide on a stronger Eurozone and a stronger Schengen area out of the context of a crisis. How to convince leaders that we have to anticipate. One day, and hopefully far away, there will be a new financial crisis or a new migration crisis. And the big question is, are we ready to face them? We know what to do for the Economic and Monetary Union. The reports of the four presidents, when I was president of the Council, 2012, or the five presidents in 2015 of the European institutions show the way. It's all in those rep reports. The new proposals of the Commission, the ideas of President Macron, or 14 leader, leading economists of France and Germany are extremely helpful. We, we, we know what to do. The question is, who will take the lead? It can only be France and Germany, respectively sensitive to solidarity and to responsibility. It will not be about reinventing the European Union, but about re-energizing the Union. Of course, I come from a small country, we need all member states on board. But for this operation, leadership is needed especially in times of populism and the re-emergence of nationalist feelings, also within our European Union. I notice already now in some of our member states a sentiment of uneasiness about a possible Franco-German initiative. But who else will do the job? And a standstill or cosmetic reforms are not an option. This shouldn't be a time of narrow-mindedness, but of rational, long-term view. The Union is used to make hard decisions in times of crisis. Now we have to do it differently. We have to act in good times. Normally we act, and this is not only the case in Europe, with the back against the wall, the abyss in front of you, and the knife on your throat. And then we make decisions. Make the union great again, but in a constructive and positive way, far from aggressiveness and negative feelings such as revenge, nostalgia, conflict, anger of jealousy. This exercise of relaunching the European project shouldn't be restricted to a catalog of technical matters. We have to touch upon the heart of the matter. And what do I mean by speaking about the heart of the matter? We have at all levels of power to reconcile openness and protection. We need open economies with free and fair trade, but also with the free movement of goods, services, people and capital. We need open societies accepting minorities in a tolerant way, integrating newcomers while safeguarding our borders. We need open democracies with respect of pluralism and the rule of law also within our union. Gender equality, the separation of church and state, the freedom of speech and of religion. These are the characteristics of our openness. And we need also protection. We need protection against unemployment, insecure jobs, huge inequalities, climate change, uncontrolled migration, social, commercial and tax dumping, terrorism, violence, corruption and fraud. 
if people are not well protected, they choose protectionism, tribalism, and nationalism. Every state has to protect its people without folding back on itself. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to create a space and a place, openness and protection. We have to reconcile the web people, openness, and the wall people, those who want to be much more protected. The movers and those who stay at home, those from nowhere and those from somewhere. If that message can't be conveyed to European citizens, the Franco-German initiative and the conclusions of the European Council have failed. The answer to many of those challenges will be more European cooperation and more European integration, not less. But this is the result of the search for this compromise between openness and protection. It is not an a priori position of a pro-European. I repeat, this balance has to be found also at a national level, at least, and a regional level as well. And look at the United States. They are facing the same kind of problems as the European Union and its member states such as migration, terrorism, inequalities, free and fair trade, and security, insecurity of jobs, etc. The current answer is populistic, more closeness than openness. America was great when it was, when it was open. It's a real paradox. There are differences, of course, between the European Union and the United States. A qualitative difference is the high degree of inequalities of income in the States which has dramatically increased since the 80s with wages lagging systematically and in a substantial way lagging productivity. One has the same trend, by the way, in ri to rising inequalities in Russia and in China, but not in the good old European Union, at least not within our member states. There are a few exceptions, especially in those member states where unemployment has risen strongly during the Eurozone crisis. In Western Europe, populism is the answer to uncontrolled migration. In Southern Europe, it is the answer to unemployment. And in the Anglo-Saxon world, it is the answer to inequality. A few words about populism. Populism can impact the economy via different channels. Populist parties are on the right when it comes to migration and identity issues. But those parties are on the defensive side regarding socioeconomic matters. And this is the case everywhere in Europe. On the latter, on socioeconomic matters, those parties are opposed to structural reforms in the labor market, in pension, and so on, and they're opposed to fiscal consolidation. A populist wants to become or to remain popular. Populism contributes to the fragmentation of the political landscape. At the moment, in the, Un in the, in the European Union, there are, in this moment, there are several countries with minority governments making a stable and long-term policy much more difficult. Some are successful, but it is much more difficult. Populist parties are by nature anti-European, although they are accepting more and more the fact the EU exists. Why? Because after Brexit, after Trump, and after Putin, the Europeans are opposed to exits. As I said, populists want to remain popular. And they are adapting themselves. And if the population becomes more pro-European or don't want to leave the Eurozone and the European Union, they change their language. And that's the case today in, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Austria, and so on. They will not leave the Union because their voters don't want to leave. But more Europe 
more European cooperation and integration is not on their agenda. And this approach leads to stagnation, doesn't lead to the relaunch of the European project. This leads to a more fragile Eurozone, to a weaker Europe, to a less pronounced role of Europe in the world. A polarized society is a blocked society where compromises, as I said, are much more difficult. Mainstream parties are tempted to partially copy the rhetoric of populists, some in order to cushion the excesses, but most do it for opportunistic reasons. The victory of President Macron is therefore so interesting. He didn't give in to the populist rhetoric and to the populist policies. In some countries, mainstream and populist parties converge, the former becoming more right-wing on migration and identity, and the latter more European. Populism is, the, populism is the result of evolutions in our society. It can, can be combated politically, but our societies have to become more balanced and more just. So, the last part of this uh, keynote address is what should be the content of the new European program. My view, it has to be focused on three objectives. Prosperity, security, and fairness. On prosperity, the European Union and the United States need a higher productivity growth through higher private and public investments. Improving the business climate is first and foremost a job of the member states. It has to go, in my view, beyond lowering corporate taxes which can end in a worldwide fiscal competition. Investment has to do with financial capital, venture capital, the European Initiative on the Capital Markets Union. It has to do with human capital, education, formation, the war on talents, and it has to do with physical capital, or financial, human, and physical capital. At the European level, the investment plan for Europe, the so-called Juncker plan, has to become permanent. It triggers until 2020 500 billion euros or more than 3% of our European GDP. Our common ambitious climate policy is an incentive for massive investment in renewable energy. Our EU budget, the come, upcoming budget for 2020-27, has to focus on merit-based research and development and on joint efforts in future-oriented activities. Horizon 2020 is the biggest scientific program in the world, and we have to continue to be as ambitious as we were in the previous uh, multi-annual financial framework 2014 2020. Prosperity demands a further deepening, and the minister had just said it, a deepening of the single market, the digital, the energy, services, public as well as private, with a high potential for productivity gains. It is work in progress, but it's too slow. A genuine economic and monetary union leads to a completion of the banking union, a fiscal union with an adapted stability and growth pact, and an economic union with more convergence. If you have a common, a common currency, you need also common policies. We are aware also in this process of deepening the economic and monetary union that gradualism is inevitable. But the first steps have to be taken immediately after the launching of this initiative, of the initiative. Postponing would undermine the Union's credibility. Ladies and gentlemen, I said a financial crisis in the future is a real possibility. The Euro area and the Schengen zone were designed for normal times, not for facing the biggest financial crisis since the 30s and not for facing the biggest influx of people coming from outside the Union. This time we have to anticipate on a future crisis. Deciding on reforms, not being 
with the back against the wall, and, but the, and this needs leadership. We will have to overcome at least two taboos in each and every proposal on which we have to take a decision. And do, those two taboos are transfer of sovereignty and more solidarity. Otherwise, if we cannot overcome those taboos, the exercise of deepening the economic and monetary union or relaunching the European project will be restricted to symbols of a minister of finance or a so-called European monetary fund. Prosperity also depends, there's another aspect in the chapter of prosperity, prosperity also depends on open markets inside the union and outside the union. The free trade agenda of the Commission is huge. India, Mercosur, Australia, New Zealand, Zealand, Indonesia are all on our to-do list. And we concluded recently with Japan, as I said. We ratified or we signed with Canada. We have a well-working agreement with South Korea and so on. So, and there is a lot in the pipeline. We hopefully this year we can conclude with Argentina and with Brazil in the framework of Mercosur and with Mexico that is a renewal of our already existing uh, free trade agreement. The union is still also in a process of enlargement whilst we are negotiating with Serbia and with Montenegro. Croatia became a member in 2013. That's not centuries ago. Actually, there is less enlargement fatigue than most people think. Of course, they have to comply with the criteria, but we are negotiating with these two countries, Serbia and Montenegro, of the Western Balkans, where such horrible things took place only 20 years ago. Employment is to a large extent also a national competence. And a new balance has to be found between flexibility, which in some countries is too high, creating social malaise, and security. In a, some of the countries, there is often too much rigidity. That's for prosperity. For security, on the agenda are promoting legal migration and actively combating illegal entries. Only when we can control illegal migration, we will get enough public support for the inevitably needed legal migration for demographic reasons. You don't suffer from that problem in Ireland, but in a lot of European countries, not only the labor force is already now in decline, but uh, the, 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 the population uh, itself is decreasing. We need a more common asylum and migration policy. I'm not saying that it has to be every, everywhere the same, a more common asylum and migration policy. We need protection of our external borders in order to maintain the Schengen area, the passport-free zone, as we did it until now. We maintained the Schengen area. But we can only protect our borders, external borders, in cooperation with the neighboring, with the riparian countries. We can't do it alone. That the EU-Turkey agreement clearly shows. We have to fight and eradicate terrorism via more integrated policies and agencies. We have to develop Africa, a continent of demographic revolution. They are now with one billion. At the end of this century, things are going on as, the, as, 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 uh, as the last years, they will be with four billion. And so this is a huge migration potential. In the security chapter, of course, we have also a military dimension, a military dimension for the Union by spending more and spending better. Cooperation among armies and industries, using economies of scale, avoiding fragmentation, making European battle groups finally operational. Interesting steps have already been taken ahead of the formal debate of the future of Europe. Interesting steps have been taken in recent months uh, inter alia, a united command of EU crisis operations and the so-called permanent structured cooperation, which is a major initiative among 25 of our member states. And the last chapter is fairness. 
it is first and foremost, again, a national competence, but the EU also can cont contribute and is actually doing so since 2013 by combating international tax fraud and evasion with tangible results already now, by fighting against other kinds of dumping, social dumping, we just agreed on a directive on posted workers, on commercial dumping, if needed, the Commission uh, is asking new instruments, but is taking also hard decisions on commercial dumping, and also by tackling discrimination between small and medium-sized enterprises and multinational corporations. A country in a standalone has no impact on international and global evolutions. Only a bloc such as the EU has enough leverage to correct global market distortions. Those three objectives are meeting deep-rooted frustrations and desires among our citizens. It is a, a joint effort of the 27, not only a, an effort made by the Brussels institutions, but some member states are already more integrated than others. Some are in the Eurozone, some are in the Schengen area, some are in both. So there is already now a multi-speed. Countries shouldn't hinder others to integrate further and in more domains. The instruments for the purpose are foreseen in the treaties. It's called enhanced cooperation or permanent structured cooperation in defense. In any case, every member state must have the possibility to join the vanguard later on. So we, we already have multi-speed, but if some are, 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 are wanting to do more, there are instruments foreseen in the treaties. Tackling those, these challenges requires a sense of compromise. We need to balance responsibility and solidarity, security and solidarity, national sovereignty and integration, growth and cohesion. We always need both blades of a scissor, one cannot applaud with one hand. We will fail to find an agreement between the North and the South on the future Eurozone reforms and between West and East on migration challenge if we cannot combine solidarity with security and responsibility. Tensions are surmountable on one condition. We need the political will and we need the leadership to overcome them then we will obtain the win-win solutions. As the Minister has said, the European Council agreed on a leader's agenda, a timetable of 18 months to make decisions in specific domains. But we shouldn't lose sight of the bigger picture. Our citizens have to see, to feel what the purpose of the exercise is. It can't be a technocratic exercise or a piecemeal approach. You always have to keep in mind the bigger picture. The agenda is ambitious, but again, the leader's agenda will need leadership. The window of opportunity is small, small in size and small in time, taking into account the European elections of June 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, Defeating populism is not an aim in itself. It is the result of a positive action to better protect our citizens against threats while keeping our democracies, our economies, and our societies open. The defeat of populism is a collateral benefit of that enterprise. And finally, I'm quoting a word very famous in my country, but it's in French. I say to the, the European Union, plus est en vous. More is in you. That should be the slogan for a program of re-energizing the European Union. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Van It's a a very broad canvas, and the Minister set it up very nicely. Um, Brexit means Brexit. 
Um, in many ways, that's a simple question. I think what Mr. Van Rompuy has done is raise far more complicated issues about the, the essence of today's discussion about the kind of Europe that we want. Uh, what more is in us? And I think from an Irish perspective that the, some of the, uh, the generosity that you're requiring, I think, may produce a kind of negativity. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's an assumption. But there is a great uh, challenge uh, in your address this afternoon. The beauty of sitting here, apart from the tan I'll have uh, from the sun lamp for the afternoon, is the ability to look out at, at our audience today. And I'm very impressed with the range of stakeholders that we have the employers, we have social housing, we have the uh, friends of the uh, senior citizens, we have uh, a huge range uh, of interests in the auditorium. We have time uh, to engage with Mr. Morumpe about those big questions that he raised. So I'd like to open this discussion to the floor uh, to untease what more is in us and where do we want to go and specifically to take great advantage of his insights uh, and experience on this occasion. So again, just as this morning, again, if people want to see if they raise, raise their hand, we have student ambassadors in the room uh, and again when you begin to speak uh, to identify yourself uh, at the outset. Okay. Mike Malloy, I work for Blair Brand, Miliband, and actually at the EU, uh, the UN, and on the Stronger In campaign. So um, I can give you a few insights from Stronger In. Um, the the m big concern I have over the, the past couple of years is the, the loss of collective memory in terms of peace and security. Um, as those that fought in the world wars die out, um, that challenge of how we keep that collective memory alive because particularly one of the challenges we had during the Stronger In campaign, you know, David Cameron gave a big speech about, you know, peace and security, and he got derided, though he's automatically saying it's going to be World War III, whereas, you know, as everyone's been saying this morning, it is a real, real concern that with the, without the EU, um, European peace and security is in great jeopardy, and one of the reasons why we have to be so strong and so united in the negotiations as an EU 27, um, and something I think that the Tories don't get in London, and so on, is that, that peace and security is, is at the core. So how do we, you know, as a young person, how do we ensure that we keep that collective memory alive? Like my former boss, Tony Blair, was instrumental in uh, Holocaust um, uh, Remembrance Day. And, you know, that's remembered on the day now. But when it started, there were big TV events, there was big commemoration. Now it's, it's kind of drawn away and seen you know, a rise of anti-Semitism. So those challenges, those kind of nasty, anti-Semitic, all the different things that have re-emerged in the past few years, allied to the common memory of war and how we keep that alive among the young people. Uh, and second, if I can just very quickly, Union of the Mediterranean has died away quite a lot. Um, uh, you know, the Mediterranean is our front door. How can we rejuvenate that? Because whether it's climate change, whether it's migration, whether it's terrorism, so many of the challenges we as Europeans face come from the Mediterranean, so maybe thoughts on that. Thank you, Rick. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, please, yeah. I, I said that the European Union is much more than just an economic project. That was my point. And it started uh, as a peace project. Uh, and we, sh we shouldn't restrict the defense and, and and, and even more than, than defense of the European Union to only jobs, how important it, it is, they are, or to money in, in general. Uh, and the debate on, on, and I said it also, the debate on Brexit is at the end a debate about common market and free trade agreement. And we started, especially in Western Europe, in a different, in a different way. We started uh, as a peace project. And I know, of course, the longer that, uh, that we are accustomed to peace, the, the, more, the, the, the less this is considered as a real argument. The, the irony uh, of the situation is that there is no country where the war, and especially the First World War, is so commemorated uh, in, uh, by, oh, also by young people, also by children, as in the UK. Uh, in, you know that uh, the battlefield in the First World War was mainly in Flanders. 
in Belgium, in my country. And thousands of British school kids come each day to, uh, to look, to be in, on, on the Minen Gate uh, and, and to, to mourn. A lot of them are even crying about what happened more than 100 years ago. So there is no country where the, the war is so present in the hearts and the minds as in the UK. And the strange thing is that the older generation voted for the leagues and the younger generation voted for the, for the remain. Those who experienced the war or just after the war, my generation, but they had a fresh memory from their parents and grandparents. They, they know, they knew what the, what the world, what, what the war was. And we say that the European Union is safeguarding, is safeguarding uh, peace. But it's just the opposite of uh, what, what happened. So I, in my country, and now I'm speaking about the Belgians, the commemoration of the First World War was a, a huge popular success. So we often underestimated who all this entered in our collective uh, memory, even if we aren't raising, raising it uh, every day. So we have to speak about, uh, about peace. And of course, if we are, have a period of 70 years of peace, we, we, we take it for granted. But I'm not sure that you, you shouldn't take it for granted. I take a very delicate example. Um, you know, in the migration crisis, at a certain moment there was a tension between Italy and Austria. Because the Austrians had the, the feeling that migrants coming from the Mediterranean were sent to their country. And they threatened to close the Brenner Pass. They didn't. We are all in the European Union, so we try to find a solution. Imagine that you are without the framework of the European Union. In any case, you, have had, you, are, you, you would have had the migration coming from the, the war zones. And then you have that kind of problem. I'm not sure this and other problems would have been solved peacefully. So we are so used to the European Union and we, dialogue, compromises, looking for solutions is in our DNA. But once you take away the framework, the ghost of the past can come back more rapidly than you can imagine. And of course we are surrounded by war. Ukraine and, and Syria. But let's take Ukraine. In Western Europe, and I can imagine also in Ireland, it is not felt as an immediate threat. Mm. But go to Poland, and not only to those in, in government, no, but all Polish people. Go to the Baltic states. There they are afraid. They will tell you that what happened in Ukraine can happen also in their country. Because they haven't forgotten history, even the recent history. And for them, it is something that is very lively present. And for them, belonging to the European Union is a protection. And even in the crisis of the Eurozone, two Baltic states joined the Eurozone. You can imagine. This is not for monetary reasons. There was no monetary reason. We were in the midst of a gigantic crisis, and the Eurozone could have fallen apart. But they want to be in the Eurozone because they want to be in the core of the European Union. There they are better protected. For, for them, peace and democracy is still a very, very strong argument. So we shouldn't look at our own situation. I was used to speak on behalf of the Union, so I, I was used to look also at what's happening uh, in, in other countries of the European Union. But we have, we have to take into account of all this. But when we speak about Europe, we shouldn't only speak with figures. We also have to speak about the broader, the broader context. And 
Europe needs lawyers, needs defenders, raising the issues that I, I just mentioned, and not only the GDP or the level of the corporate tax. Thank you. Can we take a question as a gentleman in the front? Danny McCoy, uh, head of IBEC. Um, my question is about the future of Europe, uh, Mr. Van Rompuy, and the options that um, Mr. Juncker has put forward. Uh, the first one, carrying on, um, always seems like the one that's the default position, and so therefore anybody with ambition shouldn't really be for that, should be going down the other options. But in fact, if you look at where Europe is today, and in no small part your own leadership, uh, the really big things that have been done inside this generation, the monetary union, always very complex, in fact, always difficult for societies afterwards, and the great enlargement, and then the global financial crisis. This is not the time for Europe to just carry on. Um, when there's a swagger among the European leaders at Davos at the moment, Europe is actually in a very strong position now from carrying on. So why would we, with great ambitions, want to jump into something as dramatic as the reforms that are being talked about at the moment, particularly given the context of the other part of the discussion, when a G7 country is leaving that block. Is carrying on not the most sensible thing to do, and is it not already showing great success? Mm. Before you answer that, I have two, we have two more before we finish. Yep. So thank you. Because in the, in the good times, the, you can have that kind of reasoning. Why change it? Never change a winning team. Um, in the bad times, then we, then, then we are saying, now no, 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 we have to act. Because we are, as I said, with the back against the wall and so on. I could turn around your argument. In, in the good times, we have to anticipate. We anticipate of future problems. And then you are more relaxed to do so than in crisis times. But the paradox is that only in crisis time you find the political support to act. Uh, and that's what we did also in the, the crisis of the Eurozone. We strengthened the governance of the Eurozone, we created new instruments, we made it much more stable. The discussion in the international press, more in the Anglo-Saxon world than in the Western European world, was not about the collapse of the Eurozone, that was for sure. The discussion was about the date, before or after Christmas 2012. We celebrated <laughs> Christmas 2017. Uh, in happy circumstances. So we, we made the Eurozone much more resilient. But I am convinced, as many others, that if in the far future a new financial crisis happens, I am not convinced that we have, that the Eurozone is robust enough. So we have, for the very first time in our history, the occasion to anticipate. Uh, and as you said, we are not in a much better position now. And that, that's my, my, my main argument, and the argument of, of most of the, of the leaders. But do we have to reinvent Europe? No. We have to re-energize Europe, to give it more ambition. And not speaking about, uh, let's say, if, uh, a more federal Europe, or, or changing the treaties, or whatsoever. But what we have, how can we consolidate it, how can we deepen it? And that's the main objective today. It is not a standstill, but it is not either some kind of uh, uh, a United States of Europe, or as I said, a reinventing Europe. It is more modest, but it's still ambitious. We, and the reasons are, there are two, both, uh, two reasons, the first is, to anticipate a future financial or migration crisis. And the second is that we, if we can't convince large parts of our societies, confronted with the populist rhetoric, if we can't convince them the added value or the value of the European Union, and we, if we can't rebalance this openness and this protection, then I'm sure that in four or five years' time, they come back. They lost the battle in France and in other countries, and they didn't lose, lose the war. And so we have, we have to perform and to show people that we can have less employment, less terrorist attacks, 
less illegal migration, more fairness, less corruption, especially in some of our member states. So we have, uh, uh, we have to take action so that we can reconcile parts of our society much more with the European project. And that, that is at stake. I agree with you that you shouldn't be over-ambitious with a stance that is not rational. Thank you. We have five minutes for two questions. I have one here and one up here in the back. So this gentleman here, to introduce yourself, please. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Derek. Graham Love, um, CEO of the Higher Education Authority. Uh, it occurs to me, and it's almost perfect. I'm up here on the balcony. Oh. <laughs> um, it's again, oversight. That's oversight, yeah. Bre bre perfect <laughs> oversight. Uh, the Brexit vote, the predictors of that Brexit vote, in particular, I suppose, the Remain, uh, if you look at it, not really age, as you spoke about yourself earlier, not about gender, not about really wealth or class. The single greatest predictor, really, was the level of education in, in, in that vote, as you go primary, post-primary particularly third level. And I'm kind of interested in what this means from a policy point of view as we, as we go forward. Beyond, I mean, calls for, you know, X percent of GDP into third level and, and, and other levels of education, etc. cetera. Um, I, I think it's critical that we, 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 we are quite specific uh, in policy terms about what this means. And I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say in this regard. Thank you. First of all, the Brexit vote, uh, there is a European dimension, but there is also, to a large extent, a British dimension. Britain joined the European Union a generation after we founded in Western Europe, in the Benelux countries, in Western Germany, in Italy, and in France, we founded the European Community. They joined us one generation later. And that, that's already something that is striking in itself. Second is, you have three pillars in the European Union. You have the common market, you have the common currency, and you have the Schengen area. Britain is only a part of the common market, not of the Eurozone, not of the Schengen area. And that makes also their situation very specific, because they never really were engaged as many other countries were engaged in the European Union in the European project. Some are even saying that they had a transactional view on Europe. What is the beef for me? What is the added value? They were never as convinced as many other countries about the value of the European Union. So that makes the vote very specific British. It's not a template for others. And they that, that's, and I said also in my speech, that's also part of the miscalculation. We thought, they thought that what's happening in Britain is happening all over the place on, in the, on the European continent. That's not the case at all. Not the case at all. In, on the contrary, there was a dramatic increase in support for EU membership in, uh, in Ireland and in the rest of the European, of the European Union. So this you cannot draw conclusions from the British experiment and, and copy-paste them for the European, mm. the European Union or the rest of the European Union. That's the first part of my answer. The second is you are absolutely right. The divide between young and old is a real divide. But there is also a divide based uh, on, uh, on the level of education. And you find also this pattern uh, in other European countries, as far as the, the voting population of populist parties uh, is, uh, is concerned. That's why, by the way, most populist parties are on the right side, on the, uh, they are right wing as far as migration and identity is concerned, but they are on the defensive side and protecting let's say, uh, the acquis, uh, the, the social acquis, protecting uh, what, what on social legislation and social security, what exists, not touching upon that, because otherwise they have to confront uh, that part of their electorate. So the, the, some are saying the, the, those parties are on the right. Yes, they are on the right on migration and, 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 and identity, but they are actually 
on the left, even on the far left, on socio-economic matters. So this is really complicated. Mm. And that's why, for me, I, I emphasize this double approach in order to keep our societies, our economies, and uh, our democracies as open as possible. And we fought during decades and centuries for having this. But we can't only maintain this openness when we protect people better. And a part of the public of populist parties belong to those people who want to be better protected. So for me, it is not only a political fight against populism, it is a fight against the, the roots, the deeper causes of populism. And protection is a key word. President Macron is using that word, and I'm happy that I used that word three years ago, but I'm not the father of the word. It was François Mitterrand who said, in Europe he protège, in a Europe that protects. And that's why I emphasize this dimension. And if people in the relaunch of the European project don't see that double approach, then we will miss the point. If it is only about a Eurozone budget or a Minister of Finance for the Eurozone uh, or the transformation of the European stability mechanism in uh, a European monetary fund, interesting, and we have to do a lot of those things, some of them not all. But the heart of the matter is elsewhere. And this is shown in the British referendum, although it's not a template. But this is also very visible when you have a closer look to the populist movement in almost all okay. of our members. Thank you. I promised the lady that we take a question. So just very briefly, please, again, if you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Audrey McCready. Um, I have to state my interest that I used to work for the European Commission for 13 years. Um, my question really, I'm glad you raised the point that you just made that Europe has to be a, more than just um, uh, the Eurozone and ministers for finance or whatever. Um, I think our president this morning really touched on a key issue um, about what's required to have uh, more guaranteed support from the EU citizen. Um, I and my colleagues when we worked in the Commission often felt uh, divided from our own leaders and could empathise a lot with European citizens outside the walls of the institution who also felt very divided from them. But, I mean, you have talked about um, how the populist parties get support in protection of the social acquis, but if you don't challenge the big business, and President Higgins this morning talked about the difference and the great inequality that exists in terms of wealth, what kind of policy uh, changes do you foresee having to be introduced to uh, challenge the power of capitalism, basically, and to um, ensure that there is a more uh, equal distribution of wealth to keep the European citizen protected and on board with the project. Okay, I'm sorry, just two minutes to address the huge <laughs> issue. Go on, I'm getting you off the hook, two minutes. Uh. I am not as long as your president, but I'm the president. <laughs> That's why I, I emphasised uh, fairness as a, a key objective for a relaunching program of the European Union, mm. and this deliberately, and this often gets forgotten. Uh, and of course, a lot, a lot can be done at the level of the member states, social security, taxation, and so on. And you can see uh, when you look at what we call in technical terms the Gini coefficient. Huh? with measuring the degree of equality and inequality. It depends on, uh, on national policies. The national policies. And we see the huge differences between the Europe, I'm speaking now in very general terms, and the United States. It has to do with the concept of society. It has to do with, uh, with, with policies. And the degree of inequality is huge between, on average, Europe and on average, uh, the, the United States. So it, it depends on, on, on really what the, the policies conducted at the level of our member states. When you look to inequalities, 
then you have to see that in a lot of our European member states, equality hasn't dramatically increased, even not even in the last 10 years, with the exception of some of the countries under program, under heavy pressure. In my country, in the France and in the Netherlands, inequality decreased even the last decade. And we are not performing worse than other countries. So again, uh, this has a huge national dimension in tackling inequalities. But there is also a European dimension. And that, that's why I was mentioning the fight against tax evasion and tax fraud. We took initiatives. When I was president of the Council, I organized a special European Council on this issue, and it provided very, very strong results. And the automatic uh, transfer of, of financial data uh, to the, the national uh, fiscal administrations and so on. You have the conclusions drawn from the Lux Leaks, for the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, and so on. It's always not enough, but going in the right direction. And other initi initiatives are taken. And by the way, solidarity exists in the European Union. For those weaker regions and weaker countries, but especially weaker regions, the European Union is, is organizing huge transfers, you know. In some of our member states, they are receiving structural funds three, with, with a dimension of, with, to an extent of 3 or 4% of GDP annually. 3 to 4%. They are in the Union because they believe in the Union, but they are also interested in the Union. And so those structural funds are extremely important to organize solidarity in the European Union and to have much more equal conditions. And actually, there is convergence when you look in the longer term. And my last word, just illustrating what, what I just said, Poland and Ukraine had the same GDP per capita in 1990. We are now 25 years later. And unfortunately, Ukraine is, as always, that it has still that legacy not completely, but still a big legacy of the Soviet time. The level of prosperity, the GDP per capita in Poland, is three or four times higher than Ukraine. That's also a dimension of equality. We give people the occasion to raise their living standards. And I can give you many, many examples. So this is a, a matter of national competence, but there is also a strong European dimension. But the, the fight against tax fraud and tax evasion is a key issue also in public imagination about what should be a more just and a more fair society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of everybody, I'd just like to thank Herman von Rompuy for a wonderfully stimulating and challenging uh, presentation this afternoon. Um, again, a presentation based on a whole life of public service and leadership in a whole variety of positions, so we're very grateful to you. Uh, I'd especially like to thank Minister Helen uh, McEntee for her presence again. Uh, the mission of Dublin City University is to transform lives and societies. We're a young, a young university, so you can imagine the great pride that we feel in having uh, one of our own uh, at the heart of this from an Irish perspective. Uh, leading the debate uh, on Europe. So we're very grateful to you both. Uh, now I will hand over to Derville MacDonald again uh, from the Independent Newspaper Group who will chair the next session. So thank you very much.